wonderful day, Father. Thank you again, and thank you that today is your Sabbath. In your name, amen. Well, welcome to everybody. Good morning to you all, my dear brothers and sisters at uh, Marino Valley. Whether you're on by uh, the internet and the website or by Facebook or YouTube, welcome. I love you all. It was wonderful to do the, the uh, communion last week. We're talking about maybe having a Friday night vespers now, so uh, watch for the announcements. We'll get that out uh, here right away. It's wonderful, just live and to see all your faces. We had 34, I think, different different computer families that are with us. So anyway, God bless you. God bless my La Sierra Spanish friends and uh, my friends at Pastor Red and the Haven. I just want to say a little introduction here to this. I have really become convicted uh, that when I go overseas to do my crusades, we need to do better to bring people to be fully devoted disciples of Jesus. We can bring people to Jesus and have a big baptism, and then a year later, where half of them or more of them gone. Doesn't do any good if they don't become disciples of Jesus and go all the way to heaven. So I'm going to add some sermons on discipleship. So I'm going to test one out. I worked on it the last few weeks, and now here's the first draft. But it's for you, too. It's for me. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus, follower of Jesus? So let me know what you think of this. Okay. I'm preaching it to you, but I'm also thinking about a thousand people in a basketball court somewhere. Preach Jesus the night before, and now I said, okay, you've given your life to Jesus. Now what? So that's where I'm coming from. Probably you've heard me talk about this. I got married, and a year later, we're in Chicago, Christmas time, and a friend came and said, Dan, I've got a ticket to the Chicago Bowl, Portland Trailblazer, Michael Jordan, Clyde Drexler, two best. You can't get tickets like that. I said, Hilda, is it okay if I go? I said, you promised me you'd make fudge that night. I said, I can't change the game. Can we change the fudge? Said, no, it's the only time I have. So you have to make a decision. Who's number one in your life? I didn't go to the game. Who's number one for you? The Bible says no other gods. God has to be first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Who's number one? You give your life to Jesus. We accept Jesus. We get forgiven and of our sins. We get baptized. We know we're going to heaven. We have a place in heaven. We have a mansion in heaven with your name on it. And you know that you have eternal life because you believe in Jesus. But the next day, Jesus comes along and he says, come, follow me. He wants us to become disciples of Jesus. Paul says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He wants us to be proud. I am a follower of Jesus. I want the world to know. I want my family to know. I want everyone to know. I'm a follower of Jesus. What difference does it make? Disciples of Jesus. For some people, you wouldn't see that it makes any difference at all. Except for the day they became a Christian and the day they got on the cloud to go to heaven. In between, same as everybody else, same as they were before. Didn't change. Nothing became any different. No, there has to be some differences. We're followers of Jesus. It makes a difference now. Revelation 14 says we follow the Lamb everywhere he goes. It's different. And here's a key verse, John 12, 26. Everyone who wants to be my disciple must follow me because my servants must be where I am. They go, we go together. We're with Jesus. 
We don't just have a day of conversion and then the same. We're followers of Jesus. I was in uh, the Philippines. We had a problem with our luggage, long story. We had to go to another city, redirect our luggage. All my team were in a hotel. I'm out. I'm the leader. 1.30 in the morning, I'm out on the sidewalk waiting for our truck to come with all of our stuff. Guy comes up to me with a picture of a girl. He says, you want some chicks? He thinks I look like the right prospect. I suppose my teams are all asleep. I could have, I could have gone with him. I'm a follower of Jesus. It doesn't matter. My wife is 8,000 miles away. It doesn't matter if my team is all asleep. It doesn't matter if it's day or night or if anyone will ever know. I am a follower of Jesus. It, I'm not part of that. A lady came up to me when I first got to La Sierra. I've been maybe a week. <laughs> Old lady, she came up. Pastor Dan, what do you believe about perfection? I thought, well, if I don't say this right, she's checking me out. She may send me back to Chicago. I said, I, I have studied perfection most of my life. I have a thick file on perfection. <laughs> Just came off across it again. I'm an expert on perfection. But I said, I don't argue with anybody about it anymore. I just want to be a follower of Jesus. And if I'm a follower of Jesus, he will take me wherever I need to go. I'm going to get home if I'll just be a follower of Jesus. I went back to Thailand in 1995, my first time back in 25 years. I can speak some of the language, but I didn't know where I was. Principal took me down after my talk to show me some things. Wanted to show me a water taxi. I'd never been. hundred people on a boat down the river. Well, we did it at 5 o'clock. The whole world come off work and down on this wharf. The boat came. They don't wait very long. My friend got on. But before I could follow him, a lady came. Just dainty, tight skirt, and very slow. By the time she got herself onto the boat, the boat began to pull away. I said, my, I've been in Thailand one night. I don't know this guy's address. I don't know what street he's on. I don't even know what area of Bangkok he's on. Ten million people. I'm going to be lost in ten million people. I better be on that boat with him. It's like five feet of brown, muddy water now. <laughs> I jumped. I got one toe on the edge of that boat, and I pulled myself in and fell on that lady. I didn't care. I was on the boat. As long as I was with him, I could get home. Doesn't matter anything else. As long as I'm a follower of Jesus, you follow Jesus, you'll get where you need to go. Lady, let me stay last year. I heard this story back when it happened, but Randy Robert told it again just before the election at Loma Linda. He was at uh, the, what is now the Honda Center down in Anaheim. And they had a big Christmas concert or something, I forget. Chris, Christian music concert. But in between all these songs, Max Lucado from Texas had a few little thoughts along the way. Los Angeles Lakers were playing San Antonio Spurs. This is David Robinson, seven foot two, Hall of Fame, great player. He's a Christian. He's a member of Lucado's church. And he gets Lucado to come down on an off night, and he brings Lucado out in front of 20,000 Christians, thinking that they'd be excited to see an NBA player who's a follower of Jesus. They boo him. 20,000 Christians, when they see a player from the other side, and they booed him. Lucado said, no, 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 he's a brother of Christ. Their basketball fan that's, was more important to them than their Christianity. Yeah. When you're a follower of Jesus, that becomes who we are. I'm a follower of Jesus. It makes a difference. A friend of mine, a pastor in the Philippines, told me this story. They have some rebels in certain places in the Philippines. 
They live out in the woods and come down and kidnap and attack people. And somehow one of the rebels was going to be a Christian, break away from his old life. But he heard a rumor that some of his old gang weren't happy that he was going to leave them and become a Christian. But he came to the baptism, got in line, they baptized him in all the baptismal robes. But when they baptized him, they found out had his gun under the robe. <laughs> if they saw him get baptized, they were started shooting, he was going to give as good as he got. They said, no. now you're a follower of Jesus. We don't go shooting people. It makes a difference. <laughs> you can't be the same as you were five minutes before. Followers of Jesus. Paul says in Romans 12, because of because of all that he has done, offer yourselves as living sacrifices. When Jesus has given his life to us, now we give our lives to him. The old movie called Saving Private Ryan is too violent. Don't watch. I've seen parts of it, but not all. But I saw the end of it. Four brothers in World War II, three have already died. They don't want the fourth one to die, so they send Tom Hanks and a bunch of soldiers to go get him, bring him out. They fight their way over to where he is. Now there's one last battle. In that last battle, Tom Hanks gets shot. He's going to die, giving his life, really, for this kid. He grabs that guy by the head, and he, says, and he shouts into his ear, you better earn this. I'm giving my life for you. I'm going to die. You've you got to live my life, too. Jesus gives his life for us. We cannot waste our life now. We're disciples of Jesus. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? It starts with this. First, you have to die. <laughs> Nobody wants to die. Death isn't any fun, but that's what the Bible says. In John chapter 12, verse 24, the key verse, I tell you the truth, unless a seed of wheat is planted in the ground and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce much wheat. Jesus says, if you abide in me, you will get, have much fruit. That's what it says. But first you have to die. You have to die, and then the fruit will come. You'll come back to life. All the disciples died terrible deaths. Polycarp, the Ephesus, was a bishop after the disciples. 80 years old, lived his whole life for Jesus. They wanted everyone to say Caesar is Lord. He would not say it, so they're going to burn him at the stake. They came to get him. He made a dinner for them, knelt down and prayed for the whole church. I said, we don't want to kill you. Just three little words. You don't have to mean it. So I'll never give up Jesus. He's a disciple of Jesus. And they walk him down and he's burned at the stake. You and I don't have to usually be burned at the stake. The Bible says, consider yourself dead to sin. You have to die in your heart to the old life. I die daily. And now you live alive to Christ. No one wants to die. Dying hurts. Dying is painful. Paul says, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Says, I've given over running my life. I'll give it to someone else. We stood in a hospital around a bed and watched my father die. We watched that heart monitor go 45, 30, 40, flat. It's hard to watch someone die. I've got two funerals last week. You throw flowers down, people are crying. There's their mother down there, 15 feet. It's hard. We want to skip that part. But Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, first you have to die. A couple of friends of mine, they pastor over in another church. They put two groups together, two churches, Tongans and Filipino, doesn't matter. But each group had their own history, their own officers. They couldn't figure out how to merge fighting for self. 
friend told me after a potluck one day, one of the Tongan women, one of the Filipino women ended up in a fight rolling around on the ground. Had to stop it. These people haven't died. They're not disciples of Jesus. You can't do that. Sister-in-law left Loma Linda, went up to Oregon, going to a little small church. She would contribute good food. One year she made it to that church. Seven, eight, ten people. Some don't criticize food she made. One time she said, Pastor Dan, they, they slid that dish down the table and she caught it in her lap. These people haven't died yet. Having a week of prayer at a church not far from here, I won't tell you where, ethnic church. I thought beautiful people <laughs> were nice to me. I had dinner with the pastor one night that week. I said, how's it going with your church? He said, Pastor Dan, my elders are not born again. They haven't died. Always fighting, criticizing, pushing. They haven't died yet, Pastor Dan. They have to die. Famous theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer ended up in the prison camp in World War II, ended up dying days before he got freed. The famous line, he says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Then you can live, but first you die. Disciples have to die. You cannot just tinker around and add a few things to your life. This is old Maury Vendon territory. I have a Toyota Camry. <laughs> Boy, I've dreamed of having a Ferrari. Maybe I don't have a house, but have a Ferrari. We're in Dubai. They have a place called Ferrari World, a big Ferrari store, big Ferrari out in front. But there's many little things you can buy, a Ferrari. Let's, so I could go buy a hood owner ornament, put the Ferrari hood ornament on my Toyota. <laughs> I'll put a Ferrari radio, put a Ferrari steering wheel, put Ferrari covers on the wheels. I could do all kinds of Ferrari things, but it would not now be a Ferrari. It would still be a Toyota Camry. You have to start all over and you have to die. If you want to change and be born again, bear much fruit. First you have to die. Number two, Jesus came to a wedding. No one knew he could do miracles. He hadn't done any miracles yet. They just wanted him at a wedding. He was fun. They invited him to all the parties. But this party began to run out because the wine ran out. And Jesus' mother did not want the party to end. So she came to Jesus. Didn't really know he could do miracles, but she knew he was special. She said, could you do something? Then she goes to the servants and she says, do whatever he says to do. That's what disciples do. We do whatever he says to do. We don't do our own thoughts anymore. Whatever the Bible says, whatever the Holy Spirit says, we listen to the voice of Jesus. Do whatever, whatever he says to do. And they fill those jars full of water, and he changes the water to wine. And everyone says, you have saved the best for last. If you want to have the best life, first you have to die. And then you do whatever he says to do. We listen to Jesus. Roman centurion came to Jesus and he said, I have a servant. Could you heal him? Just heal my servant. But you don't have to go. I know you're busy. Just say the word, Jesus. I have people under me. I say go and he goes. Whatever. Just say the word, Jesus. And I heard Bill Hybels say, could I just be like that? Say the word, Jesus. I'll do it. You say to go, I'll go. You come, I'll come. Just say the word. Do whatever he tells you to do. Number three, you want to be like Jesus. You think of all the debates we have had in the church, justification and sanctification and how are you saved and what is God's part and my part, all the other theological debates. Can we just boil it all down to this? I want to be like Jesus. I want to become more like Jesus. Romans 8, 29, he chose us to become like his son. 
Follow his example. Let's give you more verses. Become like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. The Spirit makes us more and more like him as we are transformed into his glorious image. Ellen White says, by beholding, we become changed. We become like who we most admire. I go to the Philippines. <laughs> Two or three weeks, that's all I'm with. They're Filipinos all day. I love them. But when I come back, she says, I begin to talk like the Filipinos. Just a little different way of putting some words together. I didn't mean to do that. I didn't say, let me. I just was around them and I began to be like them. And if we're with Jesus, we read the words of Jesus, the stories of Jesus, we will become like Jesus. Wants us to be like Jesus. It's all I want is to be like Jesus. Story I've used for a long time. I was in Chicago with Michael Jordan. I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like Michael Jordan. I'm gonna put a basketball hoop up. I'm gonna put it at seven feet. He's at ten feet. I'm gonna do seven. I can dunk at seven. Back then. <laughs> I'll do 10 dunks every day, seven feet. Next day, add one inch, 10 more dunks. Every day, another inch until I'm doing it 10 feet. Flying like Michael Jordan, I'll play for the Bulls and make $10 million a year. I could do 1,000 dunks. I'll never become like Michael Jordan. But the Bible says I can become like Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. For... Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. We're becoming like Jesus. We died. Not the same anymore. Number four, we live for the glory of God. We don't live for our own glory anymore. We live for the glory of God. Isaiah 43, 7. You were created for the glory of God. I've been going through my stuff. I've gone from 11 file cabinets down to three, got rid of most of my books, gave them to La Sierra. Have some, the good ones, the best ones. The boys told us, Dad, we're going to throw it all in the trash anyway. May as well start throwing it now. <laughs> it's hard. We're told that whatever you do, if it isn't for the glory of God, it's all going to go in the trash. It's all going to go in the dumpster anyway. As one guy said at the end of the Monopoly game, it all goes back in the box. The only things that are going to last are what you do for the glory of God. You were created for the glory of God. That's what it means to be a disciple for the glory of God. I go overseas. We build a church or we do a crusade. Afterward, they give me almost always a plaque. Nice plaques. And they read it and everyone claps. It's all very nice. What am I going to do with 100, 200 plaques? I don't do it for the plaque. I don't do it to get a picture in the Pacific Union recorder or in the review. I don't do it to have everyone clap. I do it for the glory of God. We build a church. I'm just thankful we have a church for the glory of God. We preach for the glory of God. That's all that matters. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you don't do it for yourself. It's for the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Number five, disciples are loving. Here's probably the classic verse you all know. John 13, 35 this is how you will know that you are my true disciples if you love one another. We could all tell stories on this, couldn't we? I'll just tell you one quick. Do all know your own. I was giving Bible studies to a man in Chicago. He invited me to come watch his daughter play a soccer game, 11, 12 years old. Here we are, 50, 60 parents watching Kids, girls play. All of a sudden, one of the girls broke out. They call it breakaway. 
When you have that, the goalie is supposed to come out to cut down the angle, but she was kind of thick, heavy set, didn't come out too quick. The girl went right around her and scored. Everyone's cheering. Coach went out there, face red, yelled, Come on, wake up, get in the game, hurry up, go faster. Red faced. My friend whispered to me, That's his daughter, he's the father. Yelling at his daughter, missed the goal. Disciples of Jesus are loving. We don't criticize, we don't put people down. We serve, we care, we'll be there for people. Loving. That's how we'll know who's a disciple. Jesus said in the final judgment, the people on the right and the left, the sheep and the goats, the difference will be, do you love people? Do you care for poor people, suffering people, hurting people? How do you treat people? Not based upon if you're right, if you're loving. Disciples of Jesus. Learning to love like Jesus. Famous story of John Harper was on the Titanic, had a six-year-old girl, and the ship began to go down, put a little girl in a lifeboat, never saw her again. Went around trying to get people to give their life to Jesus before they died. Gave his life jacket. Somebody said, you need this more than me. Died. Loving. Disciple of Jesus. You want to be a disciple? Got to die. Follow him. Live for his glory. Become like him. Loving. I'm going to talk about the ceiling before we're done. The Bible says at the end of the world, there's going to be a ceiling. Revelation 7 says another angel is going to come from the east with the seal of the living God. And he said, don't destroy anything until we seal all the servants of Jesus in their forehead. It's going to be a ceiling. But you don't have to wait until the end. To be sealed, to be set apart for Jesus. Revelation 14 says there'll be 144,000 who are the first fruits. They are so committed to Jesus. They are like the upper room people back in Acts 2. They have been with Jesus. They love Jesus. They are committed to Jesus. They'll do anything for Jesus. They walk all over the world. They will die for Jesus. They're the first fruit. They're sealed. God doesn't have to wonder. There's no more questions. There's no more maybe. Committed. All in. Sealed. And they are the ones who get on fire and tell everyone else. I want to be part of that group. Don't have to wait. Don't have to wait for a final crisis. We can settle it now. I am a disciple of Jesus. I'm going to die for Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. Done. Settled. I want to be sealed. That's my dream, to be sealed, to have a church full of people sealed to Jesus. Tell Jesus, don't waste any more time on me. Go find the rest of the people because you've got me. I'll never give it up. Sealed to Jesus. Settle it once and for all. Disciple, follower of Jesus. Let's pray. Our dear Father in heaven, I thank you. The gospel is so much more than just one day when we come to Jesus and have our sins forgiven. But you say, come, follow me. Not just those 12, but we all get to be disciples of Jesus. May we follow you, Father. May we be willing to die so that we can bear much fruit. May we follow you, the Lamb, wherever you go. May we do whatever you say. Just say the word, we'll do it. May we live our lives for the glory of God. So I pray for everyone listening to this today, Father. May we be fully devoted, radical disciples of Jesus, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. See you next week. We'll take it a little farther.